Welcome to the Talent Equation Podcast. If you are passionate about helping young people to unleash their potential and want to find ways to do that better, then you've come to the right place. The Talent Equation Podcast seeks to answer the important questions facing parents, coaches, and talent developers as they try to help young people become the best they can be. This is a series of unscripted, unpolished conversations between people at the razor's edge of the talent community who are prepared to share their knowledge, experiences, and challenges in an effort to help others get better faster. Listen, reflect, and don't forget to join the discussion at thetalentequation.co.uk. Enjoy the show. just wanted to jump in before the start of today's show and uh, tell you about some learning and development events that I think you might be uh, be really interested in. I know I'm certainly very excited. Uh, at the beginning of the year, in, uh, in the new year, um, uh, with John O'Sullivan and Mark Bennett, um, we will be getting together to discuss the future of coaching um, with the help of uh, Juan Gonzalez Mendia from Sud America Coaching, who is putting on the event. And um, I'm sure it's going to be uh, really stimulating. I'm so excited about getting together with John. We haven't seen each other for ages, so uh, it's going to be uh, going to be really good. And I equally haven't spent very much time with with Mark uh, as my mentor. So every time I speak with him, I know I always come away with enormous amount of learning various things that I've uh, I need to refine tweak uh, and improve on and then later in the year at the end of March um, I've been working with the, the fantastic staff um, at uh, Stuart Melville's College in Edinburgh so I'll be going north of the border uh, to do the very first talent equation live it's going to be an experiment in conversation um, and uh, I've got some uh, some other friends of the show joining me on that day as well um, where I've got uh, Danny Newcomb, uh, Russell Earnshaw, um, uh, John Fletcher, the Magic Academy boys, uh, and we're getting together as well for some conversations. And, uh, and and Mark will be coming as well. Mark Bennett will be coming up for that one to, to discuss some of his principles as well. Really excited about those couple of days, um, and I highly recommend getting on board if you can. Um, uh, I'll look forward to seeing you and uh, learning together. All the details are available on the events page of my website. So uh, if you want to book on, go there and you'll get all the links that you need. In the meantime, on with today's show. Sergio Lara Bartial, welcome to the show. Well done there with your pronunciation. Thank you so much. <laughs> it's, a, it's a real pleasure. It's a, an absolute honor. Thank you for the invite. As it as I embarked on saying your name, I uh, I realised halfway, just literally as I started, I was like a fear factor of oh my god, I'm going to get this wrong. But I'm glad <laughs> I did. I'm glad I got it right. You did very well. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, I've been looking forward to this conversation for some time because you are doing some amazing things in the world of youth sport and coaching and and all that sort of stuff. We, we've we sort of known each other from the coaching world, I suppose, one way or another for quite a long time because we sort of, you were working in, uh, you were working for um, Sports Coach UK as it was. Yeah. Uh, were you even, were you there when it was the National Coaching Foundation? No, no, I came into UK coaching uh, in 2008. Okay. Uh, and I was right. there until 2011. Yeah. yeah, I joined them when you just moved on. So we right. yeah, yeah. crossed paths as colleagues, but obviously I was operating and swimming in that kind of space. Anyway, before let, let me let me uh, over to you. Really, kind of give me the backstory. Tell me tell me your uh, your whole potted history. Right. So um, I, I'll try and be brief. <laughs> but basically, um, I, I was born in Spain and raised in Spain. Um, but then in 1999, uh, nearly 20 years ago, it's hard to um, hard to believe, really. Um, I made the decision to move to the UK for one year. Um, I graduated, yeah. It was a, the, the plan was one year. Um, there's been no more plans made after that. Um, <laughs> and both my, uh, my wife and I graduated at the same time from uni. And we wanted to take a year out uh, to learn English and, and see the world a little bit. Um, we're still trying to learn English after 20 years. <laughs> um, but yeah, we came to, uh, we came to the UK um, just with the plan of finding any job here for a year uh, and then going back to to Spain to to get a proper job down there. Mm. Um, 
I used to play basketball, you could say professionally in Spain. I, I got to play Division Three, um, which is by all accounts a pretty good level in Spain. Um, but I was kind of disappointed really at that point because I thought I'm never going to make Division One, which was my always my dream. Um, so at that point, I stopped playing, um, finished university, and the plan was to come to the UK, work here for a year, and then come back and, and, and forget about basketball and coaching and playing and, uh, and just uh, just get a, get a normal job. Uh, but then as I got to the UK, um, I happened to be playing um, a pickup game um, two months into my stay in the UK and, and was spotted by by the coach of the, the Liverpool team. I was in Liverpool at that point. Um, and he said to me, why don't you play National League for us this year? I was like, what does that mean? <laughs> uh, well, you, um, you, we're in Division 2 here and we just travel all over the UK every weekend to, to play games. So why not? Um, and then that's how I got back into into the sport um, by chance, really in the UK. Um, over the course of that year, I was asked to go to to the following year to go to Manchester and play for Manchester, and I've been in Manchester ever since. And I've been at the same club now since 2000. Uh, and and one of the things that I always had clear was that uh, I, I wanted to coach. I like coaching. Um, so every 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 club that I played for, even back home in in Spain. I always coached in the junior programs. Um, so I did the same in Liverpool. I coached in Liverpool. Uh, and then when I moved to Manchester, I coached in Manchester as well. Um, and Manchester offered me the possibility to to work full-time for the club um, in the community programs, coaching in the schools. Um, and that's what made me stay because um, I really fell in love with coaching. Um, I was already in love with coaching, but I really loved it here because it was the first time that I was kind of able to do it full-time. Um and, and then just really evolved, um, I, I took the opportunity to do a master's in sports psychology in 2002, I think it was, at John Moores University in Liverpool. Um, not because I wanted to be a sports psychologist, but because I wanted to be a better coach. Mm. Um, and I did that and I loved it. Um, I, I loved academia. I was always quite academic in that sense. Um, but then I forgot about academia completely for another 10 years, really, <laughs> um, until um, after years of coaching at the club, working for uh, for the city council in Manchester as a basketball development officer, um, coaching national teams for five years for, for Team GB. Um, at that point, I had to kind of make a decision really about where I wanted to go next because it was too much. I was coaching every night, every weekend, then going away to two months of the year um, with the Team GB while still working full-time for the city council. It was a bit of a nightmare. Um, it was a difficult situation. And I ended up... Um, uh, you know, looking for a job with uh, with UK coaching, um, stopped coaching for a year to just kind of settle things a little bit. Um, went to UK coaching um, and, and I spent three years there. Um, at that point, I was very fortunate to to meet the the late Pat Duffy, um, and Pat was a Pat really changed my life. Really, um, I think like like he changed many people's lives really <laughs> in his own lifetime. Really. Um, and, and then when Pat moved on from UK coaching to Leeds Beckett, um, I followed. Um, and I was very fortunate to, to be offered a chance to work full time at Leeds Beckett while doing my PhD. Um, and that was it really. And that's kind of 20 years summarized in, in, in three or four minutes. But it was, a, like I say, it was never planned, um, but it's worked out very well. Um, yeah, <laughs> and that's where we are now. Uh, Try not to make any more plans for the future. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, I mean, it's it's funny, isn't it? How it's quite often I like uh, people journeys and things like that, and how how just you know one decision and then something else happens and something else happens, and something happens, and you and you you move into your career. Let me let me just um, just dwelling on the the bit you talked about about coaching for Team GB. I mean, that's interesting, uh, an interesting experience. Talk me through that. It was it was a massive learning experience, really. Um, I, I, for me, it was a case of, um, I'm going to be completely honest with you, was, I was in the right place at the right time, really, um, both in terms of the club, but in terms of GB. Um, so at the club, I mean, the, the reason why I ended up coaching GB teams is because we were doing very well at club level. Uh -huh. uh, at the club, my first couple of years, I coached in the boys' program and we did very well. But then the club offered me the, um, the chance to build the, the girl and women's program because at that point we only had one team um, so I took it on and I um, I, I became the um, if you want the director of the women's program um, and we built it from one under 14 team to teams at 
under 12, 14, 16, 18, Division 2 and Division 1 women. Um, and we were extremely fortunate that we we found an amazing crop of players. You know, we, um, at a point where women's basketball wasn't very well developed in, in, in the UK. Um, so we were very successful um, with, you know, and like I say, I, I have no, uh, no problems admitting this really. I had, I mean, you know, a lot of those players ended up playing for England and still some of them do. Um, mm. You know, in the in the team that won the silver, the silver at the uh, Commonwealth Games, there were, I think, three players from from that crop, really, which is amazing, uh, 10 years later. Mm. Um, and that's how I ended up coaching Team GB, really. And I, I you know, I, I was coaching Team GB quite young. Uh, I did the under-18s, the under-20s, and I was also an assistant coach with the women, um, and it was just a, a fantastic learning experience, really. Because um, I was, a, I mean, I'm, we're always learning, right? But even at that point, I was relatively early in my in my coaching career. So I was thrown in the deep end really early uh, by hook or by crook. Um, and I loved it. Um, yeah. But God, it's, it's one of those where I, I always, because I do a lot of work now with coaches that are in, in that position that I was on, you know, 10, 10 years ago people that are coaching national teams uh, or that are getting themselves ready to coach national teams. And I always say the same thing, really. I, I never realised what it is to coach a national team until you coach a national team, really. Mm. And, and and how demanding it is and how... Um, I think, you know, people always think that because you're travelling the world coaching, um, it's fantastic and it's, a, it's, it's like, a, like a paid holiday. And people have no idea really how... how exhausting it is to, to coach uh, at that level really where you're coaching 24-7 um, and the biggest challenge is to look after yourself because you're constantly doing stuff you're either dealing with players you're coaching you're scouting other teams you are it's, it's full on um, and I, I, I always say I didn't realise what I, what I was letting myself into until I got there um, and you know but if you um, reflect on it now fantastic learning experience really I think I learned so much in those five years that it's helped me everywhere not just in coaching it's helped me with my with my academic uh, with my academic career with my family life with everything really is a um, fantastic learning experience but it's a it's a it's a hot topic at the moment in terms of you know they talk a lot about a duty of care for athletes and yeah um, making sure that you know athletes are given the right kind of support and all those sorts of things but I think what's often overlooked is duty of care for coaches as well so you've alluded to the fact that it's a pretty high octane high pressure um, you know it demands a lot of you and looking after yourself so kind of what what approaches did you take to help you with looking after yourself because actually even at the grassroots level nowadays I think people people feel similar pressures not maybe mm. with the same level of intensity but there's quite a bit you know I mean being a coach is quite a, quite a big level of responsibility you know you've got the the development and the lives of young people in your hands and there's parents who are you know very engaged in their development and very emotionally attached and it does feel quite pressureful sometimes so just walk me through some of the approaches you took yeah I mean <laughs> I mean, if, if I before I before I walk you through uh, my own approach, um, just to reiterate what you're saying, really, it is a um, it is a really important area um, and completely overlooked. Um, I mean, there's lots of research now showing, you know, how stressful coaching is really, um, mm. and and the uh, the pressures that coaches are under. And like you say, it's not only at the highest level. At the highest level, is massive. Okay, but even you know, I'm, I'm coaching on the 14 boys now and I still feel those pressures um, at every level. Um, in the, um, you know, we did um, a couple of years ago a study on serial winning coaches. So we were able to interview 70 coaches, 17 coaches that have won gold at the Olympics or the World Championships repeatedly over 20 years, you know, with different players, different teams. Um, so really super coaches, serial winners. Um, and when we talked to them, uh, they were very clear that one of the main things that you needed to to do or to have to become a serial winner was to to last long enough in the game. <laughs> um, and to last long enough, you need to look after yourself and you need to find ways to... You're never going to get rid of that pressure, but you need to manage it well because the pressure is always going to be there. And, it, you know, and these guys actually embraced the pressure and they loved the pressure. But they also found found ways to switch off and to to combat that pressure. How I did it, 
um, I did it very poorly. Yeah. That's uh, that's the first thing that you probably need to know. Um, <laughs> and I think that's what led to me in 2009 having to stop for a year. Because um, I, I, I was so passionate about it. I wanted to do so well. Um, I wanted to do well for my club and I wanted to do well for, um, for, for Team GB. And I felt like every decision was life or, life or death, really. Mm-hmm. Um, so I didn't do it very well. Um, and I think I learned after I stopped, really, um, the kind of things that I should have done, really. Um, uh, like trying, the first thing is you trying to do too much. Um, and you have to learn to either delegate. And if you, don't, if you don't have anybody to delegate on, you need to find those people. Mm. Um, and you need to be brave and find and be creative to find people um, to do things with you and for you. Um, without budgets, without, you know, people want to work at that level. So if you find the right person, they'll do it for nothing and they'll do a great job as well. Um, I think I had to learn really to, to be able to tell when I was on duty and when I was off duty yeah. and make, make the most of your duty time with family, with myself. Um, one of the things that I did and I've, I've kept up really since um, in 2008 I started running uh, which led me to do a few marathons and I still run at least you know two three four times a week um, and I kind of make a, an appointment with myself to run because it's, that's my me time that's my time out there really um, yeah being able to even when you are away trying to stay in touch with family you know now you know I've got two kids uh, um, and, our, and our wife, of, we've been together 26 years. Um, so you have to keep that going as well. And and and, and not just because one of the, the, the dangers of coaching at any level really is that you get so sucked into it that you forget about everything else around you. Um, so yeah, those are the things that I kind of really learn to do now because, I mean, and again, you... I now have to do those even in my professional life really as a as an academic. I travel maybe even more now than I did when I was coaching, which is ironic. Um but I think all those learnings from the coaching I'm trying to apply now to to my current job really if you want. Mm. So it's an interesting area actually, um, because I mean I, I recently had some conversations with um Sam Jarman, who talks quite a lot about, um, I guess, the nature of the human experience. And I think one of the interesting things about this is, I think a lot of people feel like the pressure comes from outside. But the reality is, is, and I think you've alluded to this, is the pressure comes from inside. It's our our perspective of what is required of us and what is what is challenging us and all those sorts of things and kind of maybe some of the work around resilience and it might be interesting I don't know whether there's anything in the research that you've done here around how those sort of super coaches or at the very least those coaches who say lasted the course you know maybe there's part of that in them which is they've just got the ability to kind of almost reframe situations in order to help them thrive within those situations as opposed to um you know just survive i suppose uh, completely and um there was a few things really that came from from the research um the, the first thing is that these guys actually in terms of reframing the situation mm. they they always talked about well you have to embrace the pressure because the pressure means that you are in right that you're there uh, and that's that's what you want. That, that's what you always wanted, right? Yeah. Which, interestingly, what, reflecting back on my time, um, it, at times when I was coaching Team GB, I was kind of resentful because it's like, oh my God, what's all this going on? You know, why am I having to deal with all of this? <laughs> um, instead of saying, well, actually, that, that's the job. That's what you wanted to do. Yeah. Uh, but these guys seem to be quite quite um, graceful in the way they accepted. This is the job, and uh, and it's and it's the job that I've always wanted. So let's just do it. Um, then um, it was interesting because uh, at, towards the end of the uh, so we wrote a paper and a book and a book chapter about this research, right? And in one of those two, um, we kind of were trying to define the type of person these people are, and we kind of gave them three three characters, if you want. And and, and a lot of the coaches fell into the the character that was very much like Indiana Jones, you mm-hmm. know they. They had a, um, a, a, a grudge with the uh, with the world, and they were trying to put the world to right, but they were also a little bit 
um, egotistic in the sense of uh, I'm doing this to prove myself. Mm. And some others were a bit more like uh, like Gandhi. They had this ulterior, higher purpose or, and, and really duty to country and and club and players, and they were doing everything for everybody else. But what we found is that both of those types also included a third type, which we call the Homer Simpson. Okay, <laughs> the uh, the guy that was able to to normalize uh, a, um, a lifestyle and a situation that is anything but normal. The guy ah. that is able to find um, the time to switch off. The guy that, you know, every coach in a way, if you look at Homer, uh, he's got uh, donuts and beer as his way to switch off. So every every coach found the equivalent of their donuts and their beer, really. And yeah. what was it for them that allowed them to to stay level, really? And to, I mean, I remember one of the quotes from one of the coaches really, really stuck with me because he said well look i just try to keep a flat tone as much as i can really where i don't when we win i don't drink champagne for a for a whole month uh, and when we lose I'm, I'm not down you know in in, in for, for another month I, I try to really stay flat really stay level and and not go up and down all the time um and that's what they did really they um they were just very good at just embracing the pressure and understanding that that's part of the game and and just actually kind of enjoying it really and you know and it was funny because at the same time which again was really reassuring for me they were always ta- they always talked about fear okay and about fear of failure um but how they actually use that as a way to keep working hard and, and avoid complacency so these were guys that have won you know between them they've won 150 gold medals at the olympics right or the world championships and they always kept talking about, yeah, but I don't know if I can win it again. And that keeps me going. And that, and, you know, that makes me get out of bed in the morning um, and, and try again. So it was a, we called it serial insecurity. Okay. <laughs> it was, but, but it wasn't debilitating. It was, yeah. it was actually motivating for them that they had to prove themselves. Um, so it's a really fine line. I mean, like, like, like anything in sport really, it's really full of fine lines really where, one step over that line and you're you're good. One step behind that line and and, and it's a disaster. Um, but these guys seem to really manage that towing that line very well. So so the message <laughs> the message I'm coming away with it here is is that basically one of the things that I think we probably help us with. Um, uh, <clears throat> I guess making sense of our lived experience a little bit and all that sort of stuff is, is to, to find your donuts and beer <laughs> almost or, what, or whatever your equivalent is. Yours is, as you said earlier, one of yours is to run yeah. to, find, to find your space where you can almost, it's not quite switch the brain off because you probably do some of your best thinking there, but it's a time mm. when you can sort of decompress. It's a time when you can uh, disconnect from the day to day and, and find that kind of space just to make sense of stuff. Is it a bit you're running? Cause I know a lot of hyper people in, uh, if you listen to like, obviously I listen to a lot of podcasts, you talk about people in various successful fields and this, that and the other. And it seems to me that people have a, that that's a common pattern when people talk about their their habits and their daily routines and all those sorts of things some people you know meditate or they find time and space to sit and just contemplate or you know probably not as formal as meditation a lot of people like you say they exercise these sorts of things you know is that is that kind of part of the mix here is is it just that opportunity to almost i guess um i guess make sense of what's going on in in your world i think it's um for for me and and i think going back to the research as well is is it's a bit of, it's two things really. It's one, on the one hand, is truly being able to find time for yourself yep. and spend time, you know, use, because this is one, I mean, and, uh, I think this happens to everybody, to, to coaches, to teachers, to parents, to doctors, to counselors, people that are in professions where they're helping others, mm. they really struggle to, mm. to let go of that role and find time where the only person they're helping is themselves. Yeah. Because they feel guilty about it, we yeah. feel guilty about it. Okay, that's and that's you know there's a lot of research around showing that. Um, so for me, that's one thing that learning to, if you want, learning to be selfish a little bit, yeah. where you find time where this is my time. Okay, yeah. and that's a, that's a big step forward. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It took me a long time, and I still struggle sometimes. Yeah. Um, and then is the the other idea is the um, yeah the, the the being able to switch off from from the activity and um, or. And it's not like you said, it's not always switching off. And 
this is now turning into a bit of a therapy session for me, but uh, <laughs> the, uh, I found two types of activities, right? Activities that allow me to think about things, okay, in a calm way. Like, so when I'm running, I can, I can think about things. In a, in a, you know, and like you say, I, I do a lot of good thinking when I'm running because, because it feels like I'm liberated somehow, okay? Uh, but also, um, we have to find activities where you completely switch off and forget about everything, okay? And for me, what I found, you mentioned meditation. Mm. So I, I, I've, I've, I'm doing some mindfulness meditation. Again, I try to do it at least two, three, four times a, a week. Um, you know, various exercises, really breathing exercises. Um, and then, you know what? Uh, I found fishing. <laughs> which <laughs> It's amazing because I used to, um, when I started running, I used to run around lakes and canals where I saw people fishing. And I always thought, oh my God, what are they doing? How boring is that? Um, and then I tried it once and absolutely loved it because I really, I really felt that it was one of the very few things where I was just so focused on on what was going on in the water that I could come. It was like meditation purely. Um, so yeah, that's kind of, um, and then obviously family time and things like that, you know, being able to do stuff with, with, with Susanna and the kids. But uh, yeah, um, I think you, but the first big step, and this happens with athletes as well. Um, I was listening to um, one of the uh, GB hockey players at the, um, Kate, what's her surname now? She was at Richardson, the... Uh, Richardson yeah. Walsh. Yeah, and remember when, uh, you were there, I think, for the uh, when she spoke at the um, at the Global Coach Conference in Liverpool. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, she said that for her, um, because she was also that type of player that was always worrying about her teammates and everything, she actually started playing a lot better when she was able to find time for herself mm. and, and only for herself. So mm. for me, that's... Um, for anyone working in, in professions where you are helping others all the time, um, you got to learn to be selfish and then you'll actually do a much better job helping others. Um, yeah. And, and but yeah, but it's difficult. Yeah. That's a ki that's a killer point, right? And mm. I just I've discovered this to my cost as well. Um, I mean, you're hundred percent right, by the way, about um, people. I, I I went through a phase and probably still have to balance this. To be totally honest, whilst we're having a joint therapy session here, <laughs> of being concerned that I was better with other people's children than I was with my own. And I hear you. <laughs> <laughs> and I feel like you know, there's a um, because I'm sort of always focused on that bit of me and, you know, being as good as I can be in that bit of me and improving all the time and learning all the time and trying to become the, you know, that, that best version of that. I realized I'm not really spending as much time on the other bit, which is the kind of what I'm doing with, with, with the children and all this. Stuff. So now that might just be me beating myself up a bit, but I, you know, I was, it's something I was just very conscious of. And then there was this other pit. And then what I discovered was, um, and, um, in the me time, bit is kind of interesting because I'm always somebody who's always wanted to you know always active playing play playing sport play golf or whatever it might be and again you feel guilty and you have to justify it and all those sorts of things because if you know a bit like you, you're away a lot you know you're working or you're doing whatever it is or you're out coaching and this that and the other so the the time then you are with your family you know you need to be able to reconnect but of course I wasn't always doing that and part of that was because I didn't have any me time Mm -hmm. I was always in the everybody else time so that when I came home, I was like, right, I just want to decompress now. And I'd almost kind of switch off from everybody around me. So I was the, you know, it was like the worst case scenario. But the weird thing was, is to put a bit of me time in there in whatever format that might be. And when I say me time, I don't just mean indulgent me time. I just mean a little bit of just something. It doesn't have to be a lot. Just yeah. enabled me to kind of refocus my energy then when I was at home to be able to be a better version of me. I'm not, I'm, my wife will probably tell you that I'm not necessarily right. <laughs> but a better version of me, if that makes sense. But it makes perfect sense, really. Um, I remember um, two or three years ago, uh, I listened to the guy at the RAF that coordinates um, how the people that have been um, into combat, the people that have gone to, to theatre, as they call it, um, how they come back home, okay? And a few years ago, they used to just go, so one day you are in the middle of Afghanistan, the next morning you are in the middle of Manchester, back in your house, mm. um, with no time to decompress. Yeah, uh, and that was a recipe for disaster, you know, yeah, because yeah. because the soldiers weren't ready to engage with their families, or they needed some me time. So this is an extreme case, obviously, because you've been in combat. Yeah, um, 
but it's not that different to what we do in a way when we're coaching when we're out there we're in, in our own type of combat it's not it's not life or death obviously yeah uh, most times <laughs> um yeah. but it is um it is combat um and what they what these guys did they they started to use a, a three four five day period where they actually flew these guys back into a before they went home they flew them into some retreat place you know mm-hmm. like a, somewhere where they could just you know, spend two or three days on the beach or whatever, just just chill out and then get yourself down to a level where you can start engaging with people, mm. okay, again. And that's, I think that's what we're trying to do as well with that me time where, look, between the the, the real stresses of the uh, of the profession, if you want, mm. and the, the added stress we put on it because we care so much, mm. okay, by the time we finish doing that job, we're not ready to engage with with people at a normal level we need some time to uh mm. to decompress really and that's i think that's what that me time gives you a little bit um, yeah. and you know and it could be it doesn't have to be coaching really i think it happens if you go through um a heavy teaching period at the university or and then you've had to mark 30 or 40 assignments or dissertations by the time you finish doing that you're good for nothing you, <laughs> you you're not you're not really the engaging type after that point uh, so I think we, we, we can all do with that me time. And, but like you say, maybe um, build, it in, build it in a little bit more proactively mm. rather than waiting to feel like that to then have to do something about it when it's, when it's too late. Um, which is, I guess, what the, uh, the guys in the RAF are doing. They've been proactive in managing those situations because they know are going to happen. Yeah, and, and coaches should know that. Which, you know, I think... Coaches understand how they feel after a game or after, and and how, you know, they should build those strategies to to bring themselves back to a, a human connection level again. Yeah, these combat. Yeah, and then you know it's like <laughs> it's like having that in, intuitive um, understanding because it, it it creeps up on you. It's not something you are aware of necessarily. And you'd even deny it. You know, you wouldn't even necessarily recognize it in yourself. And so it's about having, even if you just create that space and time, then it just becomes a habit. And then it's not something that you have to be conscious of and you think that you need. You just build it into your habit, right? I'm just going to create that little bit of space. I mean, I remember, again, similar to you, you know, when I was coaching on National League side, you know, I put my heart and soul into this job, right? Mm-hmm. And it was, and and as I was coming towards the end of it, the last sort of two or three seasons, I also happened to have, you know, we had our first child and the, the balancing act of that. But, you know, um, I, I just feel sorry for, I don't know why she's still with me. Uh, but it's sorry for my wife though, because I would come back, you know, if we hadn't, didn't have the right result or even if we'd had the right result, but things had happened that I wasn't particularly pleased with. Mm-hmm. I mean, fortunately it was a good distance away. So I had time in the car to at least sort of <laughs> process some of that. But even then, it wasn't quite enough. I still needed probably another buffer in between, but I'd come home with all that baggage and on, on offload it you know and, and i know we do that with work anyway don't we we come back but yeah. of course you know it's, it's like it's just i don't know it's just a very difficult thing to get the balance of it's quite hard to put it's hard to describe actually kind of that what that's like really isn't it it is and i think um uh, i think we've both been fortunate to find someone that that can see that okay <laughs> yeah. um because m- m- my wife says this to me all the time where she knows me so well now that she can tell when i'm processing something in my head mm-hmm. and she will leave me alone Mm. Okay, mm. And, and and she won't take it personal that I'm, that I'm not paying any attention to to her or to the people. <laughs> she knows I'm working through something in my head, and mm. and she knows that until I've done that, I'm not good for anything. Yeah. Uh, and at that point, then once I've done that, or I've had the time to to get it off my chest or whatever, then I, I'll, I'll come back and be Sergio the dad again. Okay. Yeah. Um, but again, I mean, because again, one of the um, surprising findings from the research on the CBO winners is that uh, out of the 17 coaches, 16 were married with children. Wow. Because to be honest, I was expecting these guys to be lone wolves and um, completely yeah. out there on their own because they were so selfish and so focused that, and none of that, you know, and obviously we couldn't establish if they were happily married, okay? Uh, <laughs> that would be another study altogether. Um, <laughs> worth worth doing, I reckon. Um <laughs> But yeah, we they 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 had a certain level of stability in, mm. in in their lives, which I think accounted for a lot of their success. Really, that that being able to to have that stability that you can build from, really, I think that's that's massively massively important. Brilliant. 
So I just want to circle back because I think it'd be really remiss if I didn't. Um, it's been just lodged away in the back of my mind um, as much as I was, enjoy- as I, as I was enjoying that. <laughs> um, you, you met Pat Duffy changed my life is something you said at the oh, start. God, I made yeah. a note of. Um, and I think, it, like you said, you, you're absolutely right. You changed a lot of people's lives and changed, I think, coaching in, certainly in the UK and, and wider than the UK now internationally. Uh, mm. in a very very big way both both in his lifetime and subsequently I mean in terms of legacy I think you know the man has an amazing legacy and I certainly was on that on that journey with him mm. and you and all those sorts of things and still still am and the reason I'm doing what I'm doing daily in terms of with this podcast but also what I'm doing in, in, in on a day-to-day basis in terms of day life owes a lot to his vision um taught me through kind of you knew you worked closer than him than I did I never I never had the fortune to actually work directly with him so taught me through what you mean by Pat Duffy changed my life and then some of the other stuff that's related to that um yeah there's a few things there really um I mean Pat changed your life because uh, at a, a really fundamental level is because whenever you spoke to him you always went away thinking good I can do this uh, and um, and he kind of always made you feel better than you were at a, at a really fundamental level, and, and really made you feel emotionally connected and and like a that you could do something, and b that that thing that you were doing was really important. Um, and that's a massive learning, really. Uh, God, I, I I fail at that all the time, trying mm-hmm. to make people feel that way. Um, and he just had a a knack for for doing that for just making you feel capable uh trusting you and then also making you feel important that you know that job you're doing there uh is important um even if, even if sometimes you didn't see that yourself okay um so that's one thing really at a personal level it just it just changed people because of the way he behaved really but then as you say we wouldn't be doing what we are doing um if it wasn't because he he really had the vision and was able to communicate that vision to others of the importance of coaching um, and really, and how we got coaching top of the agenda, particularly, you know, from 2003, 2004 onwards, uh, all through the pre London Olympics period. Um, and, and that's why now, you know, all governing bodies in the UK have people looking after coaching and, you know, and that's why we have uh, organizations that look after coaching. That's why coaching is a hot topic you know, because it wasn't like that really um, 15 years ago. Um, and, and and despite the fact that we still have progress to make in coaching in the UK, um, when I travel the world and I say to people, look, in the UK, we have an organization that looks after coaching. In the UK, every home country um, sports council will have someone that looks after coaching, uh, like, like in your case for, uh, for a sport England. Every governing body will have something, someone that looks after coach education. Coach education and coach development matters, okay? And we're still a long way from where we want to be, okay? Um, but it is on the table. It is on the agenda. And, and there are people that work full-time in coaching in terms of both um, the policy and system building um, type of thing. But also the, the number of coaches working now part-time or full-time has increased over the, over the last few years a lot. Um, for a number of reasons, and I think Pat was as the was at the forefront of that really of engaging with the right people and convincing the right people that coaching was important. Um, we have now I think over seventy universities offering coaching degrees in the UK, mm-hmm. which is um, by far more than any other country in the world. Um, whether those graduates have the outlets to then go and, and have a career in coaching is another matter, but um, uh, but we're working on that. Um, but yeah, Pat, Pat just really made all that possible, really, with his vision. And, and it's not only having the vision; he was he was good at making people engage with that vision and making people believe in that in that vision. Um, and I think we all uh, we all feel so indebted to him that we're all trying to keep that going, and and because we believe in it. And I think that's that's what he did. Really, he made you he just made you believe. Uh, yeah. He, um, I mean, his his leadership capabilities, I think, were you know clear for everybody to see. He had a a real amazing manner. I mean, he wasn't um, wasn't somebody who 
shouted from the rooftops or, you know, it wasn't tub thumping speeches or anything like that. He had a very calm, quiet, um, you know, kind of um, manner about him. But he spoke with great authority. And when he spoke, he listened. And he had a, also had a brilliant knack of bringing people with him. I mean, he managed to galvanize what was and still is quite a um, disparate and disconnected world, you know, disconnected space and kind of get everybody on board with a, with an ideal, you know, I mean, he called it the UK coaching framework and, you know, it was an ideal really, wasn't it? And it, it's, it's still to this day an unrealized ideal, but we're still working on it, which yeah. is quite fascinating, really. It is incredible really. And God, I was, I was, I was really fortunate. Um, Cause uh, I, I knew him from UK coaching, right? But when I was at UK coaching or sports coach UK back in the day, um, we didn't really cl- work very close together because I was I was in there for only six months before he left, really kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, but then, as I moved to when when he started working at Leeds Beckett, um, and I followed shortly after, um, we we were very close, very very close uh, for three years, three and a half years. Um, and one of the projects that we worked on was the international sport coaching framework. Uh-huh. And you were talking before about the difficulties of bringing a disparate group of people together mm-hmm. within the UK. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think about that <laughs> at an international level, right? We had a, a for the uh, this was incredible at the for the international sport coaching framework. We had a working group of about thirty-five people yeah. from five continents. Um, international federations, um, world anti-doping agency, governments, all kinds, really. Um, and, you know, we, we used to have um, working group meetings every three or four months. And just to see Pat handle those meetings, really, and how he, um, he brought people together, how he also allowed people to express their opinion and never shut anybody down, never. Um, uh, and just, you know, just took to people people's opinions on board and then build around it. It was just, um, I always say that I had a, a, a master's degree uh, by, by practice, just watching, watching Pat really. And, and I still ask myself when I'm doing things like that now, you know, what would Pat do in this situation? Um, yeah. And, um, and, and it's always, and it's always useful really, you know, to think back about what he would have done. Um, yeah. It's, it's, um, it, it he had a fantastic way of bringing people together and and getting them to to agree on the common on the common benefit for everybody. He, he kind of focused always on the um, on the common benefit, trying to and trying to to keep the, um, the 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 places where people didn't agree really keep those on the per, on the periphery and really concentrate people on. Yeah, but we're doing this because it's like a bit like the uh, the Simon Sinek thing. Mm. Um, why are we doing this? Yeah, why yeah. are we doing this? You know why? Why is it so important that we do get this done? Forget about the uh, the areas where you disagree, but why do we need to get this done? Um, no, it was amazing, really. So Simon Sinek, just talking about him, actually. Um, I mean, if anybody hasn't seen his TED Talk or any of his other stuff on mm. YouTube, it really is worth looking into. But um, a recommendation for anybody as well is, so his book's great, Start With Why, talking about finding your why and all that sort of stuff. But that's the follow-up book. It's called Finding Your Why. And it's actually okay. brilliant because what it does is it takes you through the step-by-step process of actually finding your why. Because actually, I think it's a much harder thing to do than people fully appreciate and realize. Yeah. Um, and it actually takes you methodologically through finding your why, your what, your how. And actually, it's a question I ask a lot now in workshops that I do with coaches. You know, why do you coach the way you coach? That's the one of the key questions I ask. And I, I, I would in, um, encourage anybody to do that. Why do I coach the way I coach? It's amazing, really. Well, and, and that's why um, this is a nice link to the iCoach Kids program, really. Yeah, because That's where I was going. <laughs> we made a purposeful decision, really, when we were developing iCoach Kids, that the first the first e-learning course, the first MOOC would be all about trying to really help people understand the why, mm. you know, why are you a children's coach? Mm. And what do children need from you? Cause if you don't understand that, that's when things can go wrong. But the moment you are very, very clear about that, then your behaviors have to follow um, or should follow, or at least you, you've got something to go on to reflect on whether your behaviors are aligned with the why. 
you know, and, and if they're not, then you need to change the uh, behaviors because the why shouldn't really change when you're coaching kids, really. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, we dedicated the, um, I think it's the uh, first and second chapter of the first book completely to understanding your why and developing your coaching philosophy and, and you know, um, your values, your beliefs around coaching, because that has to be the starting point. So let's just let's just kind of re- rewind a second there because uh, we were moving towards the I coach kids. I was there was part of a bit of a journey here. Um, talk me through the genesis of I coach kids, what it is, and kind of what it's becoming. I suppose. But it, it kind of started ten years ago, right? Um, so in my so I was at UK coaching for three years, um, and the last eighteen months I was the national lead for children. Okay. So my job was to try and really develop resources and, and, and bring the governing bodies together around the idea of how do we look after the children's coach better to, to benefit the child. Um, so the work that I started doing there was kind of the, um, the genesis of all this. Um, then as I moved to, um, to Leeds Beckett, that I, I had to park it for a little bit. Um, and I did a few blogs and things on my own, but it, it didn't go very far. Um, but really... At that point, I felt that in the UK, we were really ahead of the curve because thanks to UK coaching, um, we were starting to develop a suite of resources that were specifically targeting the children's coach Mm -hmm. because the majority of the, um, uh, even the governing body qualifications, they they tend to be quite generic. Um, And some of that has changed a little bit over the last 10 years because of the work that we did at UK coaching. Um, But they're they're quite generic. So whether you are hoping to become the next team GB coach or whether you're coaching one hour a week in a, in a community club, you do the same level one and the same level two, right? Uh, and we knew there was a gap there where, you know, can we provide something to really fill that gap where if you're going to be coaching kids and you're going to be coaching kids for the next five to 10 years, can you become the best children's coach you can be? And what kind of information do you need? Um, yeah. which again was something that Pat Duffy was quite influential on years ago, this idea of well, we want expert coaches at every level. We don't want expert coaches only at the Olympics. Yeah. We want expert coaches working with, with, with children. So anyway, we um, we had that gap in the UK, although it was starting to get filled by the work of UK coaching and some of the governing bodies. But that gap is huge everywhere else around the world. Because mm. um, in, in, there's hardly any other countries that have identified this as a gap in the majority of countries is still a very linear coach education system, level one, level two, level three, level four, everybody does the same. It doesn't matter whether, whether you coach kids or adults or, or whatever, or elite. Um, so we had the idea of trying to develop something that would be a starting point for all those coaches all over the, well, all over Europe. And in fact, all over the world, because once it's online, it's all over the world. Um, so we applied for a, a, an Erasmus Plus grant together with another seven organizations around, around Europe um, to develop these, these, these resources, really uh, starting with, uh, with a website that has a number of ideas in there and, and you know, in themes. Uh, but really the centerpiece was the, was the development of um, three e-learning courses um, on, on different topics that would give you a great foundation if you're going to coach kids. Um, and that would really, like I say, help you reflect on what it is to coach kids and why, why, you know, what it is that children want and need from from sport and from a coach, um, and then giving you all the, um, if you want the, the the knowledge and the tricks of the trade to do a good job, really in doing that. Um, and that's what we've been trying to do for the last two years. We've got one more year left in the in the program. Um, we, the website is fully functional. Um, you know, we I think we we are at a point now where we need to relook at the website to to make it more fit for purpose, um, because we've been focusing very heavily on the development of the e-learning. Um, the first one has just been released, um, and the other two, the next two, course two and course three, will be ready um, next summer. Um, and that's in a nutshell what iCoach Kid is trying to do: supporting those coaches that. Um, are working with kids but perhaps don't have access to children's specific information mm. which mm. is i mean uh, you know i can't stress how mm. important that is because i think you're absolutely right um the 
the act of coaching children, in my opinion, is, I mean, if, if I had a pound for every time someone says, oh, I'm just a kid, I, I'm just a helper, I just coach kids. You know, I just <laughs> coach kids like yeah. it's like it's nothing. Right. And I'm like, but that's that's a real skill. You know, firstly, it's a brilliant thing to do. Full full stop for both the individuals who are in, on the receiving end and for the individuals who are providing it. You know, it's a great thing to do. But secondly, it's um, it's actually to, to, to do it well is so skillful when I see you know, people who are brilliant coaches of children, right? I just, I can see it and I just go, God, that's so skillful. But yeah. a lot of people don't really see that. And, and part of that, I suppose, is because of the way coaching is perceived and, and what they think people, you know, it's like just, oh yeah, just, you know, just follow a recipe and this, that and the other, which to a certain extent is a lot of what it's like. But I'm a bit like you, my, my dream or vision is to firstly recognize excellent coaches of children and to allow them to be recognized for their excellence mm -hmm. and the second thing is to um help more people on that journey of excellence and to encourage more people to take that journey of excellence so uh, i feel like the 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 more we can have out there that helps people whose focus is around coaching children um then uh you know it, it that's a really important area and a very very under resourced and uh, undervalued area yeah and i think i think typically you you've got to the two extremes of people that coach kids right on the one hand you have the the ones that you described the ones that go I, i'm only a helper i just coach kids okay mm -hmm. without yeah. realizing the impact they have on the kids yeah but also you've got the other extreme the, the guys that go into it um and they're coaching um a local community team as if it was manchester united yeah okay um, and you've got the two extremes, the, um, the, 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 the wannabe professional coaches, but are, they don't realize they're working with nine year olds. Um, and the guys that are just, I'm just helping. I'm just the parent that didn't run fast enough. Yeah. Okay. Um, um, and that's why helping them understand the impact of that experience on the child, um, is amazing because again, I mean, and this came up from my, my PhD research. Um, coaches are even more influential than parents at times, you know. Um, and I've seen I've seen that with my own kids, right? So um, my my eldest has has played as well as basketball. He's played rugby and football. Um, and my goodness, and he knows what I do for a living, right? And he knows that I I coach coaches, if you will. Um, but if his coach said something, that was the gospel, really. No matter, you know, if his coach said to him, you need to do this, he would do it. If I, if I told him, he wouldn't do it. Yeah. Okay? Uh, but if coach said something, it's, a, uh, it's the word of God. Um, <laughs> and, and it is really helping coaches understand the power they have over, over the kid. Even if you only see that kid one hour a week, it doesn't matter. Um, and also the impact long term that you can have on, on a child's perception of, sport or on the relationship with the game on the wanting to do physical activity 20 years later um you know if we if we if we all understood that i think we would invest a lot more in helping those coaches develop um you know you, you wouldn't dream of um having teachers in in primary schools that were unqualified or unprepared um, because of the impact they have on the kids, right? But we don't mind doing that in sport where the impact is similar, if not yeah. more. Because because the other thing that came out from my PhD research was actually the impact is potentially more in sport than in school mm. because kids go to school because they have to, but they yeah. come to sport because they want to. Yeah. So it means a lot more to them. Um, and, and, and that's where you know we need to be mindful because it's an activity that means a lot to them. So if it's not done in the right way, the consequences will be very negative, really. Yeah, and and I think the a big thing there that's the point you you allude to is uh, talking about their sort of different types of coaches and their ideas and all that sort of stuff. So there's this big conversation that goes on at the moment around you know kind of athlete centered or player centeredness, mm. and 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 capturing that in terms of what is it that children want and also need from their sports experience and finding the balance of that. So you went and developed um, 
I think, a, a means by which to mm. kind of try and capture that in terms of the pledge. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, the um, during the first 12 months of the iCoach Kids project, we actually spent a lot of that time going through all the academic research that, that we could find related to this area. Um, we wrote a lit review that people can download from the website if they're struggling to go to sleep. Uh, <laughs> but then we, uh, we distilled that into the 10 golden rules, as we call them, of the iCoach Kids pledge, really, which is, okay, we are coaching with kids. This is kind of a nice roadmap really i wouldn't call it a recipe because then you really have to interpret it in your own context but it's a bit of a guide 10 guidance points of things that we know we need to look after um and i can run you through the 10 points really i i thought you were going to ask me this question so i had them on the uh, <laughs> I, I was ready for this um so you, you mentioned the first one is to be child-centered mm. really just to make sure that I mean, the, the best way that I've found to describe being child-centered is every decision you make should be based on the best interest of the children. Mm -hmm. And that, that's a, a, you know, a, a good starting point, really. If you can always take a second to think, how is this going to impact on the kids? Yeah. Um, and then before you make the decision, that would be great. Second is to be holistic in the sense of uh, being able to understand that as well as developing their physical and technical capabilities, you have a responsibility to, um, but the responsibility and the power really to, to help them grow as people, mm -hmm. you know, uh, again, the same point, if, 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 if we, if a school said to us that, no, you bring your kids here and all we want to do with them is to teach them maths, we would be outraged. Okay. Yeah. Because we, we would expect the teachers to be role models and all that stuff. But in sport, we seem to be quite happy sometimes that it's all about learning the sport. No, there's a lot. And the sport is like, gives you a great ground to really um, develop a lot of the um, personal skills, really, uh, and, and life skills. So that's, that's you know, being able to, as a coach, uh, if you want, double plan. Plan for the development of the sport, but also plan for the other stuff. Plan how are you going to implement, how are you going to help them to develop socially, through sport, how are you going to help them to develop their resilience or or their teamwork or their effort? Um, then three is a really interesting one because it's this idea of being inclusive. And by being inclusive, I don't mean it's all about uh, children with a disability or children with a special needs. It's being inclusive overall mm. because even if you coach um, a group of children <coughs> that don't have um, a registered disability, if you want, they all have different levels of ability. Mm. So you have to cater for everybody. I think that that's the main thing that really, you have to remove barriers for everybody and then cater for everybody. Um, on, that, on that subject, um, I was at a coach development session on Monday night and um, we, we, during the conversation, it was kind of quite, it was a Q and A and a conversation about mm. coaching children. And um, somebody used the term, they said, you know, you've got your, <clears throat> your better players and your weaker players. And I found myself challenging that, mm. that terminology, not just because of the words, but it's also a way of thinking that there are better and weaker. And I just said, what if we conceive of, of the children as just having different abilities, not, not weaker or better? Because that's, that's based on our conception of what better or good or more you know, perform, perform looks like. And that get, that's more of a performance mindset, which immediately yeah. takes you away from the child-centeredness and the inclusivity. So I said, if you just think of them as having different abilities, then yeah. it changes your mindset about how you cater for them. Yeah, because, you know, and, and I don't know how what age group these guys were coaching that you were talking to, but... A range, but mostly sort yeah. of, I guess, five to about 50. Five to fourteen, something like that. Yeah, and and that's where you know, in those age groups, really, what is the point of trying to distinguish between the good ones and the uh, not so good ones? It's just pointless, really, because to be honest, in terms of uh, how many of those kids are ever going to actually be the real good ones, you know, the, the ones that play professional sport, the chances is that none of them. Okay, mm -hmm. when you look at the, uh, the 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 percentages, really, so you should treat them all like let's try and get them each of them to be the best they can be. Mm -hmm. um, and, and not put labels on them as good, not so good, not very good at all, okay? Um, but more about understanding where they all are, so then you can plan your sessions to try and stretch all of them, 
a little bit. And it's hard, don't get me wrong. I, I, I mean, I always say that to me, the hardest thing in coaching is, is to differentiate and mm-hmm. to create sessions where everybody's working within their stretch level, you know, where yeah. they are. That's hard, it, particularly in team sport. Mm-hmm. It's so difficult. I mean, if you, um, so in my group that I'm coaching now, we've, we've got, uh, if everybody shows up on a given day, we've got 24 kids. Okay, because we're running two squads together. That's hard. Okay, that, and that's um, a planning nightmare. <laughs> no, because you have to spend a lot of time planning. Because if you you can't wing it, you can't really get there and and try to run a good session where everybody's doing something that benefits them um, without having planned it. Uh, and that's why I always harp on about planning a lot. Because if we're gonna get to this level of detail where we're trying to give every child what they need. And what they want, you have to plan. There's no two, and, and then obviously the plan will will go to pieces really most of the time. But you have to start somewhere. You have to have a, a guidance there really, and yeah, and, and, and but it's so hard. And I, and I think we should spend really in coach education a lot more time on on the, on giving coaches the skills and the understanding of how to do that, um, like using the step model and things like that, and. Yeah, because it is, it is a very hard thing to do, but we have to. I, uh, it's funny, um, we will come back to four because we're only on to three. <laughs> but um, uh, it's funny on that point around differentiation and planning in particular. Hmm. Um, what's interesting is <clears throat> I'm not sure, and I'll just be interested to think out loud with hmm. you on this. Hmm. I'm not sure if planning is the right way of conceiving of what we do. Um, because I think historically planning is there's a piece of paper and there's some boxes and whatever, and it says, this is the activity and this is the time and this is what we'll do. And it's usually done in a fairly linear fashion and, you know, there'll yeah. be, you know, and all that sort of stuff. And then we generally speaking, when we first start out, we pretty much slavishly stick to that plan because, you know, that's our safety net and our comfort blanket yeah. and we've proceeded through. And then as I've become more and more experienced, I've begun to do less, less planning mm-hmm. perhaps, and more, um, conceiving of activity or game or format and then conceiving of the means the ways in which i'm going to um manipulate that activity or format a theme if you like um in order to meet each each individual's needs and also to ensure that there's enough engagement, but also then potentially some progression as well. And so yeah. I don't call that planning. I'm not quite sure what I call it. Preparing, I think, might be um, yeah. might be a better way of de- describing it. So it's not that there's less preparation. It's just it's not as formulaic as it used to be because yeah. I've found that adapting and sometimes just adjusting with what's happening you know as the young as the youngsters sort of they do stuff that surprises me mm-hmm. and they do they take it in a different direction or they make a suggestion i i'm now much much more open to that's interesting let's let's explore that for a bit do you know what i mean so oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. don't quite know how to describe it but it's a slightly different idea maybe no i i agree and i think um i think i'm i'm more along the lines of what you described really in terms of a uh, I'm preparing is good as well because because I was panicking a bit when you said that I don't I don't I don't like planning because I was thinking planning is my like you say it's my comfort blanket really if I if I come to a session and I haven't planned goodness me I'm <clears throat> I'm not in a good place because I need to know that that I've kind of preempted what was going to happen really and and that I've you know like you said I've gone through the process of saying well when we do that activity this is what I'm trying to get from it or this is what I'm hoping that they get from it. But as you say, um, these three guys here might get more from it because they are at different levels. So we're going to put these rules in here for these guys. Mm-hmm. Uh, or we're going to um, match these three guys against these three other guys so they push each other. Mm-hmm. Uh, or that we're going to actually get these three guys to work with these other three guys that are l- less able at this point so they can... Um, these guys can show them the ropes if you want. Um, that's the preparation that I think it takes that level of uh, a yeah. deep thinking yeah. to go into a session with a little bit of a guarantee that you're going to hit the mark. Uh, yeah. And then as you say, um, don't, don't be a slave to the plan or to the preparation document, really go with the flow of the kids. And um, I'm God, I mean, I'm trying 
if I had to go back to all, through all my session plans and think of a session where I got through the whole session plan, mm. I think we, we go back to 2005 or something. <laughs> because I, I'm, I've got into the habit of planning thematically, really, what's the theme for the session? What am I trying to get, really? And, and giving myself a number of ideas, activities, games, drills. Um, and then, as you say, play the um, play the kit, really. You know, yeah. It might be that we, we end up the whole session with one game. Yes, because they've took to it so well, and they're learning everything that we wanted them to learn, um, or they're starting to learn everything that we wanted them to learn, um, and we just have to modify some parameters of the game, and that game is, can stretch for an hour, you know, if you if you modify things really. Um, so, so no, I I think I agree, I agree with you on that one about. Um, I think my whole point is of trying to really have a clear idea of what you're trying to do in that session um, what you're trying to help them understand in that session um, and a clear idea of what, what I always say maybe I'm, I'm too negative really but a clear idea of what may go wrong yes because over the, over the years you understand where the risks are in yeah. each of the activities yeah um, and try to be ready for those you know if that doesn't work because of this because you know it might not work um, what am I going to do I suppose to I always really look for coaches where when I'm watching someone else coach, uh, I think there are two types of coaches. Coaches that see, I mean, I think I think most people will see that something is not working, but then some coaches will not change anything, yeah. either because they don't know what to do next or because it's kind of changing is like losing face. Like it means that you got it wrong yeah, and you'd rather not change it and blame the kids because it's not working well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, and other coaches that are straight away, you know, within – Within 20 seconds of running an activity, they go, no, that's not going to work. Let's do on, on the flip side, actually, quite often I'll see people who are too quick to change. Yeah. yeah. You know, almost like because there's a, it's, diff- it's a bit difficult, it's a bit, bit of a struggle. Yeah. You know, oh, I've got this wrong, I've got this wrong, change it. And I'm like, well, actually, you know what? The fact they aren't getting this, that's, that's okay because mm-hmm. they're working it out, you know? And it's, that, that's a bit of a, that's something that I think is difficult to probably put your finger on is kind of knowing when it, the difference well, I mean, that big point really, because I think the, the, the difference there is um, understanding whether the activity is not working because of a design fault yes, or because the kids still haven't got it, yes. in, in which case you just give them the time to get it. Yes. Um, and that's, I mean, we're now getting into the, uh, the nitty gritty, the art of coaching, understanding, you know, is it the design or is it the, uh, the kids or is it the, the, the stage of development of, of where we are? Um, I, and, and that's where it gets really pretty, doesn't it? <laughs> uh, for, for for us geeks, really, when you um, when you're thinking at that level, and and when you actually, uh, that's one of the things that I really love when I'm doing um, any kind of coach education, coach development, where where you see those light bulbs going off uh, in coaches as they progress through through those levels of seeing things in a very one dimensional way, um, to actually being able to see all the because coaching is about shades of grey all the time I mean for me it's hardly ever black and white um, and it's through experience and trial and error that you learn to see different shades of grey um, but it's hardly ever black and white for me perfect yeah. right let's come back to four yeah so <laughs> four, four I sometimes think that four should be one okay and, and maybe we got this one wrong but this idea of making not it linear through, though is it it's just no a- it's just they're all they're all, they're all uh, <laughs> And they all, to be honest, they all interlink really. But this idea of making it fun and safe, fun and safe. Um, is is massive, really, in the sense of a. Uh, I think we, uh, you know, one of the things that we're doing with I Coach Kids on Twitter, we we tweet a coaching hack every now and again. Mm, yeah, I see them, they're great. Um, and and one of the things, you know, one of them says, you know, the only the only the three questions you should be asking yourself is always. Will they come back? Will they come back? Will they come back? And for me, that's the idea of the year. If they're enjoying themselves, they will come back. And if they come back, they, then they will have a chance to learn through you or through their own experience. But if they're not there, they're never going to learn. By the way, uh, I, I still own the coachinghacks.com domain name. Oh, <laughs> I didn't know that. So it was fantastic when I saw that you come out with coaching hacks. So uh, <laughs> maybe, there's a, maybe there's a bit of collaboration we could do there. How much do we owe you already in royalties then? <laughs> <laughs> you said that earlier. <laughs> yeah, so that that idea of um, you know, if they are not enjoying themselves, um, they're not going to come back. But also, we know again from research that when people enjoy themselves, their brains open about a lot more, so they they're more capable of learning. Um, 
which is why children love video games because they're constantly having a great time and, and learning from that. Mm-hmm. Um, and sometimes we, one other, another, another hack is this idea of uh, don't let learning get in the way of fun, but do it yeah. the other way. You know, make fun, but pave the way for learning. Really, mm-hmm. um, sometimes we get lost in our own. Um, you, you're gonna learn this today, type of thing, and uh, and yeah. we we take our eye off of the real uh, need of the child, really. Um, so that's four. Um, five is very related to that. This idea of prioritizing the love for a sport above learning sport. Really, let's really get them into a into a situation where they 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 can get enough. Um, we did some work in the Philippines a few years ago. Um, and our contact there was a, a Jesuit priest, okay? And I'm not a very religious person, okay? Mm-hmm. But this guy really got, got to me because he said to me, look, one thing that I've always done is, so you, can, you can't really force people into excellence. You have to love them into excellence. Uh, wow. That stood with me, really. That's really powerful, the idea of, if you love people hard enough, they, they will, it's a bit like, like, that's what Pat Duffy did, you know? Yeah. Pat loved everybody into excellence. He never forced anybody into excellence. Um, so that's five. Six, um, this idea of focusing on foundational skills. You know, whether you are a football, rugby, streaming, whatever whatever sport you're on, really at this age, you should be trying to give them a, um, a broad range of skills. Um, and the pushback from the coaches is always, yeah, but the parents expect me to do a basketball session or a football session or a hockey session. Yeah, that's okay. But you can you can do a foundational skill session with a theme of your sport, but don't lose sight of the fact that you are there to develop them um, as a whole in terms of the the capacities as a the technical and tactical capacities. Because I mean, you do hockey, I do basketball. Mm-hmm. There's so many tactical similarities between hockey and basketball. Yes. It's amazing. It's, it's, I mean, I when I watch a basketball when I watch when I watch a hockey game, I go. Ooh, okay, I wish sometimes our basketball players were able to to overlap each other like you do in hockey or to find that gap in the middle of the defense like you do in hockey. Mm-hmm. Um, so that, that's the idea of the foundational skills, both at the technical and tactical level. Um, seven is always a very controversial one, this idea of engaging parents positively. And for me, it's massive. Parents are the biggest resource we have as coaches. Um, parents are not the enemy. This is not a... Uh, Darth Vader, Obi Wan Kenobi situation. Uh, you have to work with the parents, and why wouldn't you? Really, when I use this um, acronym, you know, in basketball we talk about the MVP, the most valuable player. Yeah. But I always say to the parents that I understand that they all have their own MVP, their most valuable possession, which is their child, mm. um, and that I respect that. So I'm going to engage with them as much as I can, and they they can always talk to me about their child. I've got my own children now. It's you know, God, you, you know that yourself. You know, you, you care so much about your own kids. Yeah. So you have to engage the parent. But also the idea that parents can bring a lot of resource to your coaching, really. Um, so my, I've got parents that do the stats for me, that do the video, that do the table officiating, um, that watch the kid, that drive the minibus. Um, you know, they're a fantastic resource. And, and the more you engage them, the more and the more they understand what you're trying to do, um, the easier it is to to have that relationship and, and it's about being proactive, not waiting for problems to happen. Um, Cause you know, I mean, only yesterday I had to explain to a parent why in the team selection for this week, I have selected one player over another. Um, years ago, I would have been a bit upset about it, having to explain that. But now I go, well, it's right. You know, you need, you need, you want to know what's going on with your child. So I'll explain it. We can agree to disagree and, and that's it. But th- let's not, Let's not take it the wrong way because it's, it's, it's just people are interested in their kids. You'd be more worried if they didn't want to know anything about their kids. Um, Absolutely. That's my um, view. That's one of the things I hear the most from, from coaches. You know, it's one of the things that they cha- they're challenged by the most, I think. And I think if you did have plans, which I imagine you have, to develop the kind of e-learning courses for um, each of these areas um, and – the positive parental engagement one probably would be one that I imagine would be, would get an awful lot of hits because um, 
and I, I fundamentally 100 percent well I, I totally agree and, and I think it almost it should almost be the first thing that a coach learns because you know you can't expect people who have such a strong emotional connection with another human being mm. to just stand by the side and expect to go well all right then I'm do whatever you like it's fine you know I, I trust you just to do exactly what you want because you've got coach written on your back it yeah. doesn't matter how qualified I was. It doesn't matter how much knowledge I had, et cetera, et cetera. I would never expect somebody to do that. And I would never expect somebody else to do that to me. So I think it's just a, it's just an initial kind of point of just respect to say to individuals, I know you have, I've got these people, right? They're, va- they're valuable to you. They're valuable to me. I'm going to do my absolute level best to give them the best possible experience possible and to help them on whatever developmental journey they decide to go on. Um, I'm probably going to make some mistakes and I'd really, really welcome your, your contribution and support and whatever you think I'm doing something wrong, come and have a conversation, you know, let's, let's have that conversation. And a big, big, you know, big part of that, you know, and there's, there's there's so much to that and there's so many elements to that because it's very, very dynamic and complex, but an area I think that really needs some exploration. But I think, you know, uh, I mean, you mentioned one thing that about you're going to make mistakes and it is so powerful when you actually sit in front of your parents of your team and go you know what i got that wrong or that thing i said in that game i shouldn't have said that mm-hmm. uh, and and then they start seeing you also as a person as opposed to as the coach and mm-hmm. they understand that this is a partnership where you're all trying to to do what's best for the kids um and so i think you know, the idea of um trying to break down barriers between coach and parents and and really make it a a three-way relationship really where you're all it's a partnership you do you know you're all trying to achieve the same thing um coming at it coming at it from different angles but that for me is really important and, and there are some you know great people doing doing work in that space now um like gordon mcclellan like um camilla knight swansea um Red, Red, is, richard shorter i just met him recently yeah. some really interesting yeah. stuff around conversations yeah, and, and in, in, you're, you're right. In the second course, we're going to have a chapter dedicated to the idea of engaging with parents because it, it is so important, very, very important. Yeah. And then 8, 9, 10, let's go. Let's go quickly there. So, I mean, we've talked about number eight already, this idea of planning progressive programs. Yeah. Really understanding the stages of development and what children need at different points and how, how to help them progress. Um, and again, my view that has to be planned. You have to have an understanding of where they are now and where you want them to be uh, and just plan accordingly. And the idea of um, number nine, using using different methods to enhance learning. And I know you're really strong on this as well, where we've come from a, a, a tradition of coaching of, you know, decades of drilling people, mm-hmm. you know, drilling cones, um, completely technical drills with no opposition. Um, to a much more um, game-based approach over the last few years, okay? Um, and I guess what we're saying there is that, um, back to my point about it's not black and white, it's what do they need at every particular point? Um, and yes, like I'm, I'm like you, in my philosophy of coaching right now, I start from a games-based approach because I want them to learn to play the game. Mm. And then I have to underpin that with whatever technical needs they have. Mm-hmm. and find ways to develop those technical skills. Some of them through the games themselves, some of them that I haven't found great ways to develop them or from experience, I feel they are harder to develop through the game and they need some underpinning with dry drills. I will still do a dry drill, but try not to have them doing that for 20 minutes. Mm-hmm. Um, just mix that up in a way that um, that the different methods of coaching enhance their learning. So mm-hmm. it's, it's really about... It goes back to the art of coaching again. When do they need a game? When do they need a drill? When do they need um, a drill within a game, if you want, repetition without repetition? Uh, how do we do that? And, and that's just a process of experimenting for me. I'm, I'm experimenting with that every day. Because um, mm. I start from, I think, a similar position to you, where my default is I'm going to start, I'm going to try to teach them something always through the game. Mm. And then make a, an informed decision when I think, yeah, but that's not happening. So I change the game or do I do I underpin that or scaffold that with a little drill there where they get a little bit of the, uh, the sense of what the movement should be like? Or um, in basketball, it's really technical. The way we finish, the way we shoot, um, it's very specific. Um, and some of those things are hard to learn 
through the game because because the game is too too fast really sometimes. Um, we could have a debate about this all day. Um, no, no, no. Is- <laughs> it's um, uh, the one thing I would say though is that I um, one of the reasons I do the whole no drills thing is because it's kind of a it's almost like a personal challenge really. I just yeah. Oh, yeah. for a long time it's been like a default. It's the starting point. Whereas what you're doing is what which I think is very very different. Which is um, the starting point is the game. We're going to learn the game, and then as we're exploring through the game and learning and discovering things about the game, we discover things that actually hmm, can't do that very well. Need to learn more about how to do that. Yeah. Okay, so here's a way of here's here's a way of understanding that. But what you're doing then is you're 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 connecting the game problem to the learning of the technical element that might help you with the game problem, which you're right, might not be discovered in the game itself. And so sometimes you have to put a little bit of a spotlight on that in order to to help that individual to solve the problem that they found in the game. But that's very, very different from the starting point saying, here's the technical solution. And at some point in this game, you're going (laughs) to need to learn that. Right. So you're going to need to use that. Right. I don't know when that's going to happen. It might not happen for the next 10 years, but at some point you're definitely going to need it. So there you thought, therefore you go in a very, very different way. And I tell you, I mean, what, something that we do to facilitate that process is um, not every session, but in, in, in every now and again, we'll do a session where we'll go, OK, for the next 20 minutes, um, you are going to um, you're going to find one skill that, you know, you're constantly required to do in games yeah. and that you are struggling with and you're going to find a way to work on it on your own. So we're actually going, you know, helping them through that process of, from the game, identifying the skill that I require, the, that I struggle. It could be anything. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then I'm going to go and, and, and do myself um, a five-minute drill on this skill and, mm-hmm. see, and see what happens really. And, and that's exactly what we're trying to do is going from, the game is always king. I say the, the game is king. You, you have, they're here to learn to play the game. Not to, you don't win the game by how many times you put the ball through your legs. Mm. Okay. Mm. You win the game by scoring more than the other team. So you need to learn the game. Mm. Um, and then just, like I say, scaffold it with, you know, fine, fine. Because again, some, sometimes if you, if you go the other way around, you might be teaching them skills that they're already very good at. Yeah. 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 Okay. And well, you could be spending your time on something else. Um, my, 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 um, my other way of doing that, by the way, is, um, and the way I kind of try and try and steer away from drills is if I'm going to do something that's say more technical in nature, so there's less, less context to it. Yeah. So I'm going to remove some of the context as in the game information, cause there's too much information. So we're going to take some of that away, strip it away. And we're just going to leave you with the exploration of the technical solution. Um, the way I might do that is I might just gamify it. So yeah. I'll, yeah. I'll throw, if let's say it was about say in hockey in, in basketball let's say it was about being able to sort of you know do, do an effective chess pass right yeah. or something along those lines i just yeah. gamify that right like for example i might just say how many can you do like between you all how many can you as an individual do like, bouncing the ball against between each other or against the wall or whatever it might be in 30 seconds or i might say how many can you do that come back exactly to your hands and you don't have to move your hands or how many come back whatever it is just put different focus on it Completely. but it's a game so it's engaging, and then there's still some learning taking place without it. So that's kind of another methodology I would adopt as far as that's concerned. Completely, concerned. No, I agree with you on that. Um, like you say, I think you made a point before about we got to put the owners on the coach. Mm-hmm. So as a personal challenge is, if you've got a clear philosophy about you want them to learn the game, you want them to have fun, is analyze everything that you do, every activity, every game, every drill. Yeah. Are you hitting those marks? And if you're not, what can you do about it? Yeah. You know, um, I think that, that, that to me, that's a starting point, really. Brilliant. Yeah. And then what's 10? 10, yeah, this is an interesting one, right? Because we always get um, uh, good comments about this one. Um, using competition in a developmental way. Mm. Okay, There's been a debate over the years, really, of we completely do away with competition or we, or no, competition is uh, the be all and end all. Uh, and I think competition looks different for different people and in different situations mm. um, and the, the actual meaning of the word uh, of the the latin word for competing is competere which is to strive to to try and get better right mm. um, and that should always be the case mm-hmm. so whether you're doing it um, at an L, you know at an older age in a traditional format of competition or whether you're doing that in a festival like competition with with, with, with young kids where you know, I, lo- I love what they do in um, in Belgium now in football, right? Um, you, you probably met Chris um, van der Hagen. 
yeah. at the uh, at the iCoach Kids Conference. You know, from under sevens down, they do these one v one and two v two festivals. Yeah, and that's competition, but it's competition yeah. in the right format for the kids. Yeah, the right format in terms of the the emotional format, in terms of the actual number of kids in the system, how they run that competition is about really. It's basically about kids scoring as many goals as possible. Yeah, on a on a Sunday morning because that's yeah. what kids want to do. Yeah, okay? yeah, yeah. And at the same time, back to the point about the game. They're learning to dribble and, and go past people, which is what they need to learn at that stage. Yeah. Because that, that's, what that's what their brain is ready for. Not, their brain is not ready to play tiki-taka at that point. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and, 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 you know, you have to, you can shape the format and the environment of competition to still give children a great um, opportunity to learn and to enjoy themselves. Because, again, competition is, is, is good, but we can... We can't superimpose adult competitive formats on children because that will turn them off completely. And the vast majority of competitive formats are adult. They're, ad- they're yeah, designed I'm... by adults, in, conceived by adults from an adult perspective of what competition should look like. And, and actually, I uh, highly recommend if people haven't listened to it already, go back to listen to the podcast that I did with Seb- Debbie Sayers from Salisbury Rovers as a, for an example of a club taking the brave decision to opt out from some formal competition structures because they, she doesn't see them as being developmentally appropriate. Mm-hmm. And, and to then redesign others that are going to be more developmentally appropriate and then to have to find other organizations and clubs who want to come and engage in that way and, and go, you know, and going to break against the mold and just not follow the, Oh, we've got to be in a league. We've got to be in a cup. We've got to have a phrase, you know, you've got to have kids in kits in teams in, in mm-hmm. leagues, you know, it doesn't have to be like that. You can do it a different way. If you're brave enough and you've got enough wherewithal to actually stay the course. Completely. I couldn't agree with you more. And, um, I would really encourage people to experiment with their competitive formats until they find the one that works for them because it'll be different for every sport. Like you said, it might be even different for every club, you know. Um, so, yeah, definitely go for Just it. This morning I've had to um, select a group of under 12s to play in our in our league match because there's a league now and we have to select a team to play in that. Honestly, I can't tell you how how uncomfortable it is every single time. Every single time I always contact the other club and say, "Look, have you got any other players because uh, I've got loads of kids who want to play and actually if you know, we could we could have some different teams, you know, one game we could notionally derive as the league game and then the other one we can just play as a as a kind of friendly match. It's just about giving people opportunities to play." But it's so difficult to get them to get them on board. Uh, but anyway, yeah. I mean, I, there's a part of me thinks maybe we should just opt out of it because I don't don't know if it gives us that much value. If I'm if I'm totally honest. Well, we uh, a couple of years ago we actually organised our own under twelve league because we just wanted to be able to play like that. You know, it doesn't matter. Just we mix the kids every. We had a league, but we pretty much mix the kids up. We we put three or four teams together from all our kids, and we just played three on three, four on four, and and just. They felt they were in a game, but it wasn't the end of the world. Brilliant. Uh, l- listen, Sergio, uh, fantastic conversation. Um, love what you're doing with iCoach Kids. Um, Thank you. In, in so many ways. I think I love the fact that it's kind of it's, it's got so much room to grow. There's so many areas to go. I think if you went through each of those different areas of the pledge, I think you could do courses. We could do a podcast on each of them. And yeah, it may definitely. well be that I that we do, um, because Great. I think there's so much to so much to discuss there, and so much information that people probably would want to take from that. Um, if people want to find out more, uh, get on board, sign the pledge, you know, get you know, join the movement. How do they do so? Best way uh, they can go on the website and have a look at it, uh, iCoachKids.eu. Um, but even better, if they find me on Twitter, um, Sergio Lara UK, um, just message me there and we'll get in touch uh, we'll have a chat on the phone or an email or whatever and, and we'll take it from there awesome awesome well um I, I look forward to staying close to um to to what you're doing um the, our club's going to sign up to the pledge uh, no doubt Brilliant. about that um it's it's now the pledge has now become a central feature in parental communication around what they should expect from us or it will it will in due course um so yeah no you've got you've got fans in 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 the clubs that i'm involved with um brilliant and, nice. and yeah looking forward to seeing the growth of of the movement thank you so much thank you thanks to you and thank you for the invitation and uh, like you know I'm, I'm really really a big fan of what you're doing as well so um <laughs> let's keep talking doesn't an hour and a half go by quick i know <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you very much All right, thank you. Take care.
Thanks for listening to the Talent Equation podcast. If you like the show, then please consider supporting it by leaving a review on your favorite podcast player, telling your friends about it, or even becoming a hero and show your appreciation by becoming a patron. Just head over to thetalentequation.co.uk and click on the Becoming a Patron button at the top of the page. Flipping boo. <laughs> what a great chat with Sergio. Oh, I mean, what a story. I just, um, whenever you, you know, speak to people, whatever, you know, it just constantly surprises me the journey they've been on. You know, oh, we'll come to, we'll come to the UK for a year. <laughs> you never leave. Well, I tell you what, uh, Spain's loss is our gain. Uh, Sergio is doing some amazing work. And uh, just absolutely brilliant to see what's going on with iCoach Kids. Highly recommend. Head over there, sign up for the pledge, uh, join the movement. Um, annually, there's a there's a great iCoach Kids conference. I went along. I was fortunate enough to be asked to speak, and um, uh, you know, uh, fantastic stuff. Some from really committed people, uh, and and it's not just on uh, in the UK. It's growing. It's all over Europe. And, Hopefully we're going to go go worldwide um, in due course. I mean, so there's so much in there. Um, a couple of little takeaways for me that I think are just really fascinating, though. Um, you can't force people into excellence. You have to love them into excellence. I mean, what a quote that I'm going to be putting on the uh, on the side of my uh, my office wall to keep me keep me uh, focused on on the job in hand. Um, uh, and then uh, one of the other things that um, really really resonated with me as well is uh, that that uh, importance of us as coaches making sure that we take care of ourselves take care of each other um, and I love that idea of making an appointment with himself to uh, to run because that's his me time and fishing even uh, who knew so uh, perhaps that's uh, that's the space uh, just made me really reflect on where where my space is probably probably recording podcasts i guess that's my my therapy session uh once a week anyway um i hope you enjoyed uh i certainly did um hope you have a great week of coaching see you next week and remember ditch those drills <laughs>